Malachi belonged to this, the latest in our season of studies in the life of Elijah. Have you ever felt tempted to run away? You feel like you've had enough, you can't cope anymore, and if only you could escape, you would be free from all your worries, your fears, your pressures and your problems. I suspect there are very few who haven't found themselves in circumstances when running away has seemed like a very attractive option. In our passage for study this evening, we're going to find Elijah running for his life. And in a sense, he's running from his life. At first, this appears to be a very sad sequel to all that has gone before, a sweeping fall from triumph to tragedy. We might say, If only Elijah had retained his courage, if only he had stood strong against the threats of Jezebel. But the problem with this is that if it were so, then Elijah would be nothing like me and perhaps nothing like you also. This account might only then make us feel ashamed of our weaknesses and of the struggles we feel when we think we ought to give up and give in. An all-conquering Elijah would give me no assurance in understanding my heart and provide me with no insights to learning more about God's amazing grace. No, we praise God for the panicking prophet because he attests to the truth that God can use in his service for his glory even weak vessels. The American author Madeleine Lingell said this, Those who believe they believe in God without passion in the heart, without anguish of mind, without uncertainty, without doubt, and even at times without despair, believe only in the idea of God and not in God himself. The God we worship is the God of the weak and the weary, The God whose central business is in the rescuing and restoring of souls. So let's read our text for this evening and learn how to apply these words to our heart. This is the word of God as we find it in 1 Kings chapter 19, reading there the first eight verses. 1 Kings 19 verses 1 to 8. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. And how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. And he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb the mount of God. And we give thanks to God for his word to us. Let's pray and ask that God will help us as we seek to apply the lessons of uh, this passage to our hearts and lives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that even in these few verses of a story that took place thousands of years ago, there's relevance There are lessons for our todays and tomorrows. You want to speak to us. You want to help us to make sense of this world, this wearying world in which we live. 
You want to reassure us of your eye upon your child, your constant care in all circumstances. So hear us, Lord, as we pray. Speak to us as we study and strengthen us to serve you well. In this world, we pray to the glory of the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you didn't know the story, if you hadn't read the portion of the Bible before that we're looking at this evening, I'm sure you have. But if you hadn't, following on from what we thought about last week in chapter 18, you, you might have anticipated that chapter 19 would begin with a great account of days of revival in Israel. You might anticipate that people now convinced that Yahweh is the true and living God would turn their backs on paganism, that they would burn all their idols, and they might even set out on a pilgrimage back to the temple in Jerusalem to worship God there. Such an assumption, of course, would be terribly wrong. Because although Ahab possesses the title of King of Israel, we know that it's really Jezebel who holds the power in the nation. She's the one who's really in charge. And it is she who did not get to witness the miraculous display on the mountaintop at Carmel. Perhaps you can Picture in your mind how Jezebel would have received the news that had been delivered from the mountaintop. This woman who herself had overseen the murders of multiple prophets would very quickly have another target in mind. It was bad enough for her to learn that Elijah had made a mockery of her god Baal and her prophets who serve him. That this god to whom she had given her whole heart, her life allegiance. And how much greater her rage would be when she realised that he was the one responsible for their massacre. So we read in 1 Kings 19 verse 2. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Later on in the book of 2 Kings, we see how the curse that Jezebel has spoken comes to pass and God's judgment comes to her. But it seems to me a little bit strange and it's hard to make sense why she sent a messenger to Elijah, not a murderer, to seek him out. But for whatever reason, in the providence of God, the prophet's life was spared on that occasion and so he legged it. And his journey for all the miles it eventually covered was a, a journey into despair. So I want to think tonight with you as we study these verses, what were the factors that led to Elijah hosting his own pity party in the wilderness? Firstly, want to want to see that Elijah believed Jezebel's word and not God's. Elijah believed Jezebel's word and not God's. Confronting 450 priests did not cost Elijah a thought, but the words of one woman put him to flight. I think I'll pass quickly by that and make no further comment on the issue. Now, we're not told the content of the reports that reached Jezebel. But evidence of fire from heaven and the sudden and predicted arrival of rain did not cause her to consider the possibility that just maybe Yahweh is the true God. That didn't cross her mind, it seems, even for a moment. She doesn't see God at work here. She blames Elijah for all that has happened and determines to make him pay with his life. And the big problem that was being faced by Elijah was that his thinking was just the same as Jezebel's. He had forgotten about God. And this miraculous display on the mountaintop, he, he suddenly realised what was up to him. And he felt that he had to carry the faith of the nation upon his own shoulders. It was all on Elijah and the burden crushed him. I love to close the, the fitness rings on my Apple Watch when we've been obsessed about it, ensuring I burn enough calories and exercise for enough minutes every day. 
And one of the fr frustrations I face is this, that on those days when I hugely exceed the requirements, when I get up the next morning, the watch is back to zero. I have to do it all again if I am to achieve my goals. And there are similarities in this with the spiritual life. We can rejoice in our victories, but we cannot rest upon our victories. Every day that you or I rise from our beds, we step into another day of spiritual battle. Yes, Elijah had played the central role in the victory over the prophets of Baal. But once again, there was a challenge to face. Once again, there was an enemy to fight. Jezebel, who was their sponsor, who had promoted the worship of these false gods in the nation, had to be faced. There would be no significant change in Israel, no transformation, no revival until she was uprooted from her place of power. But for the first time, we discovered that Elijah was afraid. Verse 3. Then he was afraid and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. If you turn back just a couple of pages back to chapter 17, there are 1 Kings 17 verses 2 and 3 we read. And the word of the Lord came to him, depart. From here and turn eastward, eastward and hide yourself by the brook of Kerith, which is east of the Jordan. Again, 1 Kings 17 verses 8 and 9 tells us, Then the word of the Lord came to him, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I've commanded a widow to feed you. 1 Kings 18 verse 1. After many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. Do you see the pattern? Why did Elijah go anywhere he went? It was always because he had received a word from the Lord to direct him. The word of the Lord came to him, depart, arise, go. God's word directed his life. God's word controlled his ways. But now we discover it's the word of Jezebel and not the word of the Lord, which is directing his paths. Rather than going, his fa going in faith, he's running in fear. And while the circumstances might be different, the same rule applies to every one of us. If the word of God is not directing your steps, then it's likely that you're going in the wrong direction. Now, it seems that when Elijah ran, he didn't really have a plan or a direction of travel in mind. He, he was, his journey was determined only by one thing, getting as far away from Jezebel as possible. I'm sure you know Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, particularly as we find it in the King James Version. There it reads, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. The Hebrew means literally, he will keep you on the right road. It, if it was to be fight or flight, Elijah who had once chosen fight, this time opts for flight. All of this because Elijah believed Jezebel's word and not God's. Secondly, we see that Elijah burned himself out in ministry. This is a simple truth. I'm sure you've heard it in some shape or form before. But when the preacher gives his all in the ministry of the word, the devil is waiting for him at the foot of the pulpit steps. Physiologically, it may simply be that there is a low mood caused by the after effects of that adrenaline rush of preaching. But spiritually, it feels like the devil is attacking. I remember hearing of Irish Presbyterian ministry students who, who trained in Scotland. And on Sunday evenings, they were invited to the home of a, a well-known preacher. And they were invited there to help him stave off the regular attacks of the devil that came to him after his Sunday exertions. 
This was their routine until the preacher married. And then the invitations dried up. And one of my colleagues commenting on this said, he obviously found a wife who was fit for the devil. American preacher Mark Driscoll speaks of what he calls bread truck Mondays. That is, days when he imagines that he would rather be doing anything than being a, a pastor, like driving a bread truck. And this is a common ministry experience, particularly on a Sunday evening, Monday morning. And it can strike anyone in, in Christian service if he or she fails to guard their hearts and to refresh their souls. You understand, like a rubber band, you can continue to stretch, but you, you cannot overstretch it without it breaking. And for the uh, person who works to serve the Lord, you cannot continue depleting your resources, physical, mental, spiritual, without taking time to rest and be refreshed before something breaks. Elijah had run far and now he was run down. Verses five to eight. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and debt and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. As Jezebel had sent a messenger to strike fear into the hearts of the prophet, so the Lord sends a messenger to infuse the prophet's heart with strength. And the prophet clearly had two evident needs, sleep and food. He needed that food to sustain him. At the start of the passage we looked at last Wednesday night, that, that begins with this message that Elijah instructs the king to go up and eat and drink. But while the king was feasting, Elijah was still fasting in prayer, seeking God's face, seeking God's answer to the needs of his nation in the sending of rain. It becomes clear as we read here that in the midst of his ministry, he had neglected the basic necessities for life, to eat, to drink, to rest, that he would ensure the necessary strength for carrying on his work. It's not that long since in our evening services, we looked at Mark chapter 6, verses 30 and 31. There we read that the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. Jesus, as a wise pastor, understood that insufficient rest, insufficient food, does not in itself make someone crumble and fall in their walk with God. But neglect of these essentials for life leaves us particularly vulnerable to attack. If we are going to stumble, if we are going to fall, it will always be at that moment when we have neglected to look after ourselves in the appropriate way. Elijah had spent the last three years on the run. We know that he'd been sought in every country with the intention that should Ahab have found him, he would have been put to death. Once again, we discover that here he is on the run. On the run for many hours, covering many miles. First from Carmel to Jezreel and then from Jezreel to Beersheba. That's 120 miles. And the, very, uh, the, the full journey that would take him all the way to Horeb would, would be somewhere in the region of 300 miles. Someone once quipped, if you're going to take up cross-country running, it's probably wise to start with a small country. Well, Elijah had run the length of the country and he had every right to feel physically exhausted. But his problems didn't only stem from the depletion of his resources. 
His vulnerability was caused by the proximity to his recent success. It's an old football adage that a team is most vulnerable immediately after they've scored. And Elijah, in the wake of his great victory, is at his most vulnerable. He faced the danger of self-confidence, which is always overconfidence, because our only confidence must be in God. The Apostle Paul knew such an experience. This led to his own battle with weakness. He testifies in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 9, writing these words. So, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being conce- becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul ministered out of weakness and as a a consequence, all the glory for the, the churches he planted, the lives he led to faith in Christ and the messages he preached and penned, all of this belongs to Christ because Paul's power was all from that one single source, the grace of God in Christ. Elijah had encountered God in a miraculous way, but having been on that mountaintop, he now journeyed into the valley. And it seems that in doing so, he left that experience of the presence of God far behind. We thought a little bit about this last Sunday evening in that study in the account of the Transfiguration. Hi, when we're on the mountaintop, we see a big God and a small world, which is a perspective that we need to take with us as we descend to encounter the world in need. F.B. Meyer writes, Circumstances, natural impossibilities, difficulties are nothing in the estimation of the soul that is occupied with God. They are as the small dust that settles on a scale, and is not considered in the measurement of weight. O man of God, get you up into the high mountain from which you may obtain a good view of the glorious land of promise and refuse to have your gaze diverted by men or things below. How does God treat those who have overexpended themselves in the work of his kingdom? Well, as I said at the start, he is the restorer of souls. In Isaiah 42, we find one of what are known as the servant songs, portraits of Jesus in the Old Testament. And there we we see this lovely picture of the tender heart of our Saviour who comes, Isaiah 42 verse 3, a bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. You see, Jesus is drawn to weakness. He does his best work in the lives of those who are experiencing adversity. He's in the business of of restoring bruised reeds, of reviving smouldering wicks. Just one illustration. In Mark's account of the resurrection, we read of the instructions given by the angel to the woman who come to the empty tomb. He says, Mark 16 verse 7, but go. Tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Why is Peter singled out? Because he was the one who had fallen. He was the one who had let his master down, denying three times. And the message comes from Jesus through the angel that Peter will see him again. There is hope for the weak disciple hope of restoration and renewal. And the care and the ministry of God to the prophet didn't just heal the wounds of the past, but strengthened him for the journey yet to come. Verse 8, And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 
40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. This was no ordinary resource that Elijah received from the Lord. It was supernatural nourishment and it sustained him through his desert journey for 40 days. God comes to us. He comes to restore us and he doesn't give us half measures. He gives us all we need to function well for him and to serve him effectively in his world. Number three, Elijah brushed others aside. Elijah was mistaken to do this alone, to to brush others away. He divested himself of all human help, leaving his faithful servant behind. I remember hearing the account of a, a Presbyterian minister who had got himself into a very bad situation. He had got himself into a bit of a mess. And when wise, godly, trusted colleagues went to call with him at the manse to offer him support and encouragement. He chased them away. And this is a strange tendency in the human heart. When help is most required, it seems that people reject it. They, they need companionship, but they choose to isolate themselves and to face the biggest battles alone. Philip Ryken comments, Depression isn't only caused by the absence of community. It also perpetuates it. When you find yourself in a low place, you you, you don't realise the need for support, friendship, fellowship, love and care. And there's this amazing thing that happens in the minds of, of those who are struggling in this way. Nothing is logical. The, the sensible things no longer seem to make sense to them. Here, Elijah thinks that he's the only one left. But don't we know that not so long ago he was confronted by the godly Obadiah who shared with him the good news that through his ministry, he had spurred the lives of a hundred of the prophets, feeding them, protecting them, hiding them. And in future weeks, we'll see that Elijah will get new and vital companionship in the person of Elisha, his successor. And he will discover that he's not alone and that God is building his church, his family, his fellowship, sustaining the faith of 7,000 believers across the nation. But for now, he has no one with him. And yet, he's not alone. God's eye is upon him. And his care is provided for him. And and we must remember that there's no journey, no escape from God that, that would ever put us beyond the reach of his love. God cares for his people. God restores the souls of his children, even when no one else is there to attend to them. And number four, finally, Elijah begged God to let him die. Legislation is being drafted around this issue of the matter of assisted dying. And there in Westminster, our own Sophie Clark is playing a significant role in trying to prepare a a Christian response to the discussions that are taking place. And this is a hugely challenging and emotive issue. It's not one that we can simply dismiss with a self-righteous smugness and say, well, it's simply wrong. Let's move on to the next issue. Just think about how do you respond when someone you love looks at you and begs you to help them die? And how are we to show care and compassion for those who find themselves on the receiving end of such a heartbreaking request? Well, please excuse me, I'm not going to begin to tackle these issues right now. But let me direct you to a very helpful resource that's available online. And indeed, it's now over six years since the Presbyterian Church in Ireland held a a conference, part of a series of events entitled The Church in the Public Square. And this particular conference was on the issues of living and dying well. The audio recordings of that day are still available You can find them on the PCI website and I would heartily recommend them to you. I find it one of the most helpful days I've ever spent at a conference. But note here in our text, 
We find a man who successfully prayed for fire and for rain, and now he prays for death. But the Lord would end his life. Verse 4, he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. Now we know that Elijah wasn't the only one of God's servants who found themselves in such dire circumstances. Moses felt that huge burden, that huge weight of responsibility of leadership in the nation, and he found himself buckling under it. In Numbers chapter 11, verses 14 and 15, he said, speaking to God, I'm not able to carry all this people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. If you treat me like this, kill me at once. If I find favor in your sight, that I may not see my wretchedness. Again, after the great days of revival, perhaps the world's greatest ever revival season in the city of Nineveh, Jonah sat overlooking the city, spoke to God and said, Jonah 4 verse 3, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And in words that are similar to those spoken by Job, the prophet Jeremiah cried out, Jeremiah 20, verses 14 to 18, saying, Cursed be the day on which I was born, the day my mother bore me. Let it not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought the news to my father. A son is born to you, making him very glad. Let that man be like the cities that the Lord overthrew without pity. Let him hear a cry in the morning and an alarm at noon, because he did not kill me in the womb. So my mother would have been my grave and her womb forever great. Why did I come out from the womb to see toil and sorrow and spend my days in shame? We began our time thinking about how common an experience it is to want to run away, to get away from everything. And it's not uncommon. It's all too common, sadly, for people to, to wish that they would get the ultimate escape. People who would want to end their life, to be free from all the burdens and pains and problems. And tragically, we know that many have acted on those feelings, ending their own lives. And most family circles will have experienced some measure of this. Many of God's greatest servants have carried such a burden struggled with that deep depression that has overcome them. One of the books that, that most helped me as I prepared for, for ministry, and I, I read it on my honeymoon, it was C.H. Spurgeon's Lectures to My Students. I recently reread it and gave a, the copy to, to Scott. But, but there in Lectures to My Students, there's a chapter entitled The Minister's Fainting Fits. And Spurgeon writes, Fits of depression come over the most of us. Usually, cheerful as we may be, we must at intervals be cast down. The strong aren't always so vigorous, the wise not always ready, the brave not always courageous, and the joyous not always happy. I know by most painful experience what deep depression in spirit means. I'm making no attempt to deal properly with these issues. They're far too complex and multifaceted to simply brush over in a few moments. But, but just one point, and this is by no means a panacea for all circumstances, but sometimes, sometimes when we feel ourselves being crushed, when our, our hearts are low, we need to join with the psalmist and preach to ourselves, asking the question of Psalm 42, verses 5 and 6. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Sometimes, sometimes we have to preach to ourselves. But note here that Elijah is allowed to vent. He's allowed to speak. There is no correction to his thinking, no rebuke. 
That was not what the prophet required in these moments. Rather, he needed rest. He needed refreshment that his soul would be restored. This had to happen before his life could be redirected. Sometimes I mistakenly try to give people instruction when really they just need care. This angelic messenger didn't make the mistake. And there's a lovely note of hope here. For one of the lessons that we can glean from this story is this. That just like Jonah's dialogue overlooking the city of Nineveh, here For Elijah, there is no human witness of these events, no one to record what the prophet had to pass through. And the great encouragement to us is that he chooses to recount this story for us. He wants us to see what happened in his life in those moments when he found himself in that deep, deep state of depression. And he he wants us to grasp the truth of God's restoring grace. And to know for each one of us that there is a pathway that leads out of even the deepest and darkest valley. One day, in a whole different book of the Bible, we have to wait until we get to the second book of Kings. The day will come for Elijah to die, to leave this world. And what a spectacular exit that will be. F.B. Meyer again comments saying, let those who long to die leave God to choose the day, else they may miss the horses and chariots of fire. Elijah feared the words of the queen of Israel. He fled exhausted from his ministry. He forsook the support of faithful friends and he felt that death was a better option than life. But in all of this, he was wrong. God hadn't given up on his servant. And beginning with with tender care and concluding that we'll get to see hopefully in future weeks with a fresh challenge, Elijah is once again restored to resume effective ministry in the dark days of the nation of Israel. God's greatest miracles always involve him bringing hope from despair, speaking light into darkness, transforming death into life. That's what happens here in the life of Elijah the prophet. That's what happened at Calvary. And that's what can happen in your life, no matter how dark and difficult it may be. If you hand it over to the Lord, he will bring light into that darkness, life where there would be death, hope in the face of despair. May you know his care, his tenderness, his restoring of your soul as he works in your heart. Let's pray together. Father, we are encouraged to know that you can use even the weakest, even those who seem to fail you, even those who flee from their responsibilities. You can turn their hearts back to you, back to the call that you have presented to them. Help us to know our souls refreshed, our hearts encouraged, our ways guided by your word. That in the difficult days that we would inevitably face, you will be enough for us. You'll be there to comfort and care for us and to bring us through. Father, we particularly bring to you this day those who are struggling with uh, depression. It's so rampant in our world and particularly post this days of pandemic, people are in despair. Lift them up, lighten their darkness, bring life into their their deathly experience. Father, may they find in you a purpose for living, a fullness of joy, a cause to sacrifice their lives for. And may we see goodness and mercy surround their days. Father, we thank you for the lessons of Elijah. Guide us to serve you well. Strengthen us to stand for you. Keep our steps in your path. We pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thanks for taking time to share this study with us. I hope it's been a blessing to you.